It's good evening. It's 7, 1900, 7 p.m. And those of you who have uh, come to earlier events organized by the Habitat and the Society for Policy Studies would be aware that we like to start on time. And if I may say in lighter vein, we've had a couple of occasions where the speaker for the evening was stuck in Derry's traffic. And yet we began, <laughs> but not today. And that's just background for you. But at the outset, I want to welcome all of you. And some of you, of course, are familiar faces. There are some new members who have joined us for this particular series. I'm delighted to welcome all of you. And I do want to make particular mention of uh, the younger generation. Both the Habitat and our society, the Society for Policy Studies, has been engaged in an outreach program to try and get the younger demography of Delhi to attend our events and such lectures. For this evening, I am very glad to introduce in our midst Mr. Jeffrey Gettleman. Some of you may know of him, you may have read his work. He is currently the Bureau Chief of the New York Times. And he has come to India after extensive experience in Africa. I've not met him, I've just read him. But his claim to fame this evening is that he is the author of a book, which is there and it's also outside, which in a way distilled his five, six years, Mr. Gettleman, in Africa? Eleven, Eleven years, there you are. In Africa, particularly in East Africa, Kenya, up and down. And when we were looking for someone who could perhaps talk to us today about the Asia-Africa Connect, and again, I don't want to, you know, take more time than necessary to introduce the subject also, which is that Africa is really, I think, a continent that is regrettably not adequately understood, not adequately studied, definitely in India. And to our shame, we also come to Africa with a number of biases, which I think are deeply ingrained in the Indian psyche, which is, I hope it will change. We thought that Mr. Gettleman, with his own experience and empathy for Africa, would be able to walk us through. And the suggestion that he had given, of course, is there, that Africa and India, what does the future hold for the Afro-Asian uh, linkages or connection? So as is the norm, Mr. Gettleman will speak for about half an hour. Is that okay, sir? And then we hope that we can make this a more interactive uh, session. On that note, let me welcome you again, sir, and all yours. I wish I, have an ac I, wish I had an accent like yours. <laughs> um, how many people in this room have been to Sub-Saharan Africa? How many people in this room have been to India? <laughs> Just seeing if you're paying attention. <laughs> Um, okay, so I stand in front of you wearing sort of two hats. I'm a journalist. I work here for the New York Times. I've been very busy in the last few weeks, a few months. This year has been very heavy uh, with news out of India. Everything from Kashmir to the election to the moon mission. <clears throat> um, I've covered that. But before I was here, I lived in Africa. Uh, my wife and I moved there when we had just been married from the U.S. It was our first posting overseas. And for me, it was a dream come true because I had traveled to Africa as a young man right out of high school and, was, and fell in love with it instantly. And Africa, for those of you who have had the good fortune of, of getting on the ground and feeling it and seeing it, has this transformative power on people. And it's become something of a cliche, um, the white guy falling for Africa. There's even a French term, le mal d'Afrique, which means the Africa disease, because it's a, a, a disease like falling in love that makes you dizzy and lose your senses and chase something that's, that's impossible to catch. And I, and I felt that. I, as a journalist, I was pushed to, to go beyond this this, this just pure sort of affection and, and endearment of Africa and to look at it critically. And for those of you who are in this room who are aspiring journalists or communication uh, majors or people thinking of going into broadcast or communication or media, um, you know this is part of our job. We can't, we have to, we, we, our job is to cast a discerning eye, not necessarily negative, 
but, but, but critical in the sense of critique, not, not critical as mean-spirited. And you're really trying to pick apart the different issues that you're covering um, and to communicate them. Like that's the number one thing that any journalist, a good journalist, excels at is communication, is reaching people and using the right words and, and tapping into your own feelings. Uh, I'm really glad you used the word empathy because that's like the number one tool that a, that a journalist has, that, that we as people have. But to get somebody to open up to you and tell you their life story and to share their feelings at dramatic times, you have to connect with them. And, and so much of the work in Africa was doing that because so much of the work in Africa was writing about crises and human rights abuse and state failure and all the different issues connected to this. Because yes, Africa has this negative stereotype of being behind the rest of the world, um, of being the dark continent. But a lot of that is based on, on, a, on a real legacy that has left the continent poorer and more unstable than any other part of the world by far.